Hello once again, I'm Gary Bates from Creation Ministries International US, joined by one of our scientists, our head scientist, Dr. Jonathan Safady. G'day. So Jonathan, we're going to talk about a, a very fascinating little creature uh, that everybody's probably seen or encountered mm -hmm. some stage, geckos. We look at them walking across the ceilings, the walls, the windows, wonder how on earth they do it. I'd like to point out here, most people have probably only seen the little small guys. I've traveled throughout Southeast Asia and uh, and different parts of the world, and I've seen these geckos uh, almost a lizard size, uh, quite considerable, but they still manage to do what they do. A lot of people think that, they wow, they must have really, really sticky feet mm -hmm. to be able to use that. But uh, in uh, when I hand over to you now and giving us the technical aspects, we're going to see it's really a marvel of intricate design. Well, it certainly is. I mean, people wondered how they could walk on the most polished glass ceilings that they could find. Nothing they couldn't stick to. How could they do it? Well, maybe suction caps. Well, no, because they realized that they would actually work in vacuum. And you realize there's no such thing as suction. Vacuums don't suck. It's the air pressure that pushes and there's no balancing counterforce. That's why the suction, so-called suction works. But if it works in a vacuum, it's not suction. Uh, but what they found not that long ago is they have such fine hairs on their feet, which are further subdivided. And uh, so it's basically molecular scale. And once you get down to the atomic scale, you've got forces there that are attractive, but extremely short range. So to, to make use of these attractive forces, you have to have incredibly fine subdivisions. So they could actually, uh, so these, in, these tiny um, attractive forces called van der Waals forces will actually attract. And that is how uh, they stick with such incredible force. We talked about electro, electric forces here yes. through these little fibers that do it. Now, immediately you, you hear something like that. That doesn't sound like something that could come about by time and chance, which is what evolution would have a, to explain everything we see mm -hmm. in every living organism. Because wouldn't there be a problem? What you've described is intricate, an intricate system that has to work uh, from the very, very first time it would appear, surely. How, how would you have any intermediate steps? Well, there's the thing. If it doesn't reach a certain threshold, it's not going to work at all. So it must be that sort of a threshold uh, of being small enough for these um, interatomic attractive forces to work. So if it's not small enough, it won't attract at all. You can't get gradually until it gets small enough. It either works or it doesn't work. It's all or nothing with this structure. Now, you and I both grown up in Australia. I'll, mm. I'll put a little uh, trivia factoid out there. Of course, when you hear that unique sound that uh, geckos make, and I'm going to pause here because mm -hmm. uh, Joseph Darnell, our post-production manager, is going to put some sound in here for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, we call those in Australia barking geckos. Of course, they don't really sound like they bark, but it is quite a unique sound, mm -hmm. uh, not really like anything else. But, um, you know, most people, as I said at the beginning, think they have sticky feet. But we mm -hmm. can think about this quite simply because, I mean, if you get a piece of sticky tape or something and you use it once or twice, it loses its stickiness. Now, right. in the same way, even though we're seeing this uh, great inspirational electrical design in gecko's feet, they still have to be self-cleaning also, don't they? Well, you see, the, the reason they, um, the cellotape gets, um, loses stickiness is it attracts dust particles, so uh, blocks the glue from sticking, but somehow the gecko keeps on sticking, so it's clearly self-cleaning. And that's the other beauty of this particular design. It's, it's not only sticky, it's self-cleaning, and that is really remarkable. Yeah, it can continue to keep doing what it does, um, has uh, an incredible self-cleaning system. The other thing people don't realize is actually gecko skin because mm -hmm. geckos can get themselves into all sorts of very, very unique places, right. different environments. They get inside your house to try to catch moths and insects, but they generally live on the trees or on you know the exteriors of buildings trying to uh, do, a, do a good job cleaning up uh, those pesky uh, things that we don't like, pesky insects. But tell us a little bit about the gecko skin and um, and why it repairs repels water so well. Well, it's interesting that there's the, such a micro design that the water droplets actually will be forced co to coalesce and then the, the, they, they combine, they release some self-surface tension. The energy has to go somewhere. So sometimes it's so powerful that it actually blows, it explodes the drop off hmm. the, the gecko skin. It's called geckovescence. <laughs> Effervescence gecko, okay. And that's also an antiseptic thing because bacteria can't survive because their cell walls get um, pulled apart. So that's an amazing antiseptic skin. Uh, because of the incredible fine structure of it. So when you say fine structure, put this into context, because my understanding is we're talking about a nanoscale structure. Exactly. It's very much nanoscale structure because you have to get small enough to actually manipulate the atoms and molecules themselves. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, that would be very, very useful in terms of, I think you just mentioned, like it's got antiseptic properties mm. in a way, so it's going to repel bacteria, mm -hmm. uh, preserve the gecko, keep it from harmful bacteria in the environment, um, etc. Yes, so, so if we can make skin like that, it would actually have a very a very gentle sort of antiseptic coating without any chemicals, but it would protect, um, uh, say, burn victims from getting um, contaminated yeah. with nasty things. So it's incredible. It's more than just sticky feet. Uh, mm. And, uh, of course, when we see such incredible design, as I said earlier, evolution's not really going to help us explain the step-by-step -step processes to get with this. And when we think about this, Jonathan, um, it's not just, well, you know, creationists and Christians saying, oh, we get the nice warm and fuzzies when we see something like this, you know, God, God is mm -hmm. a master designer. But actually human beings are actually copying, this is one mm -hmm. of the areas they're copying designs from nature. This is something you've written about a lot, and I know mm -hmm. it's one of your favorite subjects. Mm -hmm. It's called biomimetics. Right. So give us an example of how scientists are actually looking at this design in nature that supposedly came about by chance and then try to model it for human application. Well, see, uh, Dr. Keller Autumn is the one who discovered this. And when he first came across this amazing design, he first said this was beyond the limits of human technology. He said nothing, nothing we could do could even match this. But now, of course, humans being made in God's image, we're, we have creativity. Humans have actually managed to make something that looks like it. But it took incredible um, technolo technological know-how to do it. And they wouldn't have thought of it if they had not seen it in the gecko in yeah. advance. And that's the real key, isn't it? So man did not come up with the idea. They're looking at actually inspiration from nature. Mm. And, of course, the uh, the great one who inspired everything, including his word and creation, is of the God of the Bible. And mm -hmm. he is, in fact, the master designer, which is a great segue to telling mm -hmm. you about a, a DVD of a talk that Jonathan gave called God the Master Designer. And besides the gecko, he has lots and lots of examples there of great design in nature and biomimicry. One of my favorite topics is the amazing design in the living world. Modern science has shown that even the simplest cells have intricate and essential nanomachines, and they have DNA or the instruction manual to build these machines and to pass on the instructions to the next generation. But we have a chicken and egg problem. The information is no use without decoding machinery, but the decoding machinery is itself encoded upon the DNA. The system could not work unless everything was there from the beginning. We also see designs on a larger scale. Many engineers are copying these designs to build novel materials and devices using ideas they'd never even thought of. If these engineers making the copy are so brilliant, then what does this say about the maker of the originals? More in the video, God the Master Designer, Evidence of Incredible Design in Nature. Now, all our videos have subtitles and they're available to stream directly from creation.com. God the Master Designer is available for streaming, downloads, and DVD right now at creation.com slash store. Just in closing, Jonathan, mm. what's a couple of other examples briefly of biomimicry that we see today? Oh, yeah. There's a, there are a number of different things. Again, things that people didn't wouldn't have thought of. Uh, were it not for seeing them first in nature. Like, see, the lobster eye works by reflection, which requires quite an interesting geometry. And that's actually been used to to make lobster eye telescopes for to see x-rays or to focus x-ray beams. But again, they wouldn't have thought of it had they not seen the design by the lobster eye in nature. So we should think if it took these brilliant scientists so much know-how to make the copies what sort of intelligence is required to make the originals they copied? Yes, absolutely. So we do, and we should be encouraged by such examples we see in nature. I think sometimes in our daily existence, we can take for granted uh, the wonderful design applications that we see all around us, mm. really, as Jonathan has explained here, even really at the atomic level, or you know, we were talking about the nanoparticle design uh, with gecko skin, for example. But... Hey, we could talk for so much uh, longer on this. Again, type in the words biomimicry or biomimetics on creation.com. Don't forget Jonathan's talk on this subject. And again, share this information. It's a great conversation starter. How would you say to your non-Christian evolutionary friend, please explain how evolution could give an account for this? And uh, at least provokes a conversation that you might be able to use to lead to talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you once again for joining us. 
and stay in touch again with everything from Creation Ministries International our website, creation.com. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. You get asked all the time by YouTube channels to do that, but simply you won't know about any new content uh, when it comes up unless you are subscribed. So thanks for joining us again today and we'll see you next time.